Well, thank you, Jinwal, for that, that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a huge honor and privilege for me to be here um, as, as, the, as the first recipient of, of the Margulies Prize. I, I'd very much like to thank UBC and everybody else in, involved in this uh, for, uh, including the people who nominated, had faith in me to nominate me uh, for, for this award. Obviously, I'd also like to thank my, my wife, Nancy, my kids, my colleagues, and students at the University of Toronto. Nothing, nothing in life is accomplished alone. It's, it's the people who are supporting you and working with you uh, and care about you that make, make things possible. So, so as I say, this is, this is a real honor and a thrill, and I've been looking forward to this for some time. Um, as, as perhaps you've gotten a bit of a flavor from Jinwa's wonderful introduction, uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about cities. I, I was a country boy who came to the University of Toronto as a young engineering undergraduate, and I immediately fell in love with cities, and I've been in love with them ever since. And, and I come at cities from the transportation point of view. I'm interested in how technology affects people and how people affect technology, and I think transportation is a great case study. So what I want to do tonight, I'm not going to talk uh, techie details about, about the models I've spent most of my research time on. I want to take a step back and, and, and take a higher level discussion about cities and transportation, because the motivation for building the models is not to, to build a needy keen model. It's to build tools that allow us to explore the future and try to find more sustainable paths into the future, to experiment in the computer, uh, because we can't ex experiment out in the real world very well. So, so the motivation uh, of all the technical work is, is sustainability, is building better cities that are more economically productive, better places to, to, to live and work, and so forth. Um, and it is, it is cities that I'm interested in. And uh, two, three years ago, um, maybe four or five, around 2008 or so, uh, the world passed a major watershed in that for the first time, over half the people in the world live in urban regions. Uh, and and uh, this is a trend that's going to continue throughout the 21st century. So the 21st century is the, city, uh, is the century of the city. Um, and I think one of the challenges we have in Canada in terms of urban policy and, and so forth is that I don't think Canadians think of themselves as urban people or as an urban nation. Uh, but in fact, we are. Uh, in, in, uh, over 80% of Canadians live and work and raise families in urban regions. And so how we build our cities fundamentally affects, that determines our economy, our, our, our social and cultural well-being, and certainly the environment. Because even though it's the polar, the polar ice cap that may be melting, much of the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that, that are leading to that are generated in cities. And, and cities, of course, have all sorts of other profound impacts on the rural hinterlands and on the nation as a whole. So, so you know, I think the, the Margulies Prize is about design. I think, I think that one of the biggest, best design challenges we have is how to build and design uh, better cities. And indeed, uh, the, the role of cities has been profound throughout human history, the rise of civilization. Is, is very, and the history of civilization is very much the history of the rise of cities. Uh, uh, Lewis Mumford, a very famous uh, urbanist uh, in, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, described cities as the containers of civilization. And, and if you look at our history and the evolution of, of cities and uh, of, of civilizations and cultures, it's tied to cities. And, and, um, and, 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 so, and, and so in order to understand ourselves and our evolution uh, as, a, as civilizations, as economies, we need to understand the role cities play in that. Similarly, throughout the history of cities, their location, size, shape, economic and social functioning has been fundamentally influenced by the transportation technology, infrastructure, and services available at the time that the, the cities are being constructed. Uh, you know, transportation literally gives shape to the city. Without the streets uh, and then transit lines and so forth, uh, it's, it's just shapeless land. So, so when we envision the city, we envision it in terms of the streets and what's, what's, what's around them. Transportation, <coughs> the role of transportation fundamentally is to make land accessible, that we can get to places so that we can do something there. We can put a building up, we can work there, we can live there, uh, we can shop there. Without transportation, you can't get from here to there. So, so the, the role of transportation is so, fun, so fundamental that we often take it for granted. And, and it's only when you know, we get stuck in congestion or, or whatnot that, that we, we start to realize that maybe, maybe this is something important to us. 
Uh, historically, cities have, have, have typically, uh, often been founded in locations of transportation advantage. There are other uh, motivating factors for where cities were located, but very often it was in a harbor or a transshipment point or at the convergence of major rivers and so on because, because in particular in, in in older older times, uh, water transportation was far by far the, the best means of transportation in terms of moving goods and people, uh, because at, at that point in time, you know, we're basically dependent upon our, our feet and animal power to move things, uh, and and so and so um, uh, water transportation was very important. Uh, provided points of uh, natural advantage. That's where cities tend to locate. A, an excellent example of this is New York City, uh, which uh, originally New Amsterdam was founded at the point of a, 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 a tremendous natural, natural deep, deep water port, uh, harbor, uh, that connected to a, a major river, the Hudson River, that provided uh, access to the interior. Uh, and, and, and so one of the reasons New York is where it is is because of that, that uh, uh, that, that, that natural advantage of the harbor and the Hudson River. But then in, in, the, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the construction of the Erie Canal connecting, connecting New York via the Hudson River to Buffalo and hence, and hence to the Great Lakes system uh, tremendously extended the reach of New York into, into the hinterland and gave New York a huge competitive advantage over its competitor cities such as Philadelphia, Boston, even Halifax and so on, who did not have the same reach into the hinterland. This, of course, is before the, the, the age of railways. Uh, a few decades later, railways came along and, 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 and continued that process of extending the hinterland of, of, of cities. But that early advantage of the Erie, Erie Canal, along with other factors, gave, gave New York a, 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 leg, a leg up on other cities that it's never, never relinquished. Uh, Pre-industrial pre, pre -industrial cities were small and dense and extremely compact uh, because of the transportation technology available to them at the time, which again was, was you know, human foot power, animals hauling carts, um, or water, water power, uh, you know, wind, wind power basically on, on, um, uh, on lakes and oceans. And, and so to be, able, and, and to be able to get around a city, you basically had to walk or go in a horse cart or something like that. So, so the, necessarily, cities had to be small, compact. You had to be able to live and work close together, have shops right there, and so on. Cities were also small because you, know, you built, built defensive walls around it to, to defend yourself from marauding barbarians and so forth. But, but transportation fundamentally limited the size that cities that, that cities could be, by and large, uh, because of, because of the technology available at the time. Um, my title is, says the, th the the third revolution, so that implies there's been two revolutions so far in in our history. Um, and the first revolution in transportation, um, and hence in the city form that was feasible to 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 build, uh, was of course it came with the industrial Re revolution, uh, steam engines. Railways and later electrical powered vehicles made possible, made mechanized transportation possible for the first time and dramatically uh, in, increased the, both the speed and the capacity and again sort of the reach of, of, of transportation and it allowed people to move out of very dense urban cores out into the first suburbs. We tend to think of suburbs as auto oriented <coughs> post World War II type creations, but suburbs have always existed, uh, and in particular, as soon as there was a commuter, uh, a steam railway running into London, downtown London, to going out into, into the countryside outside of London, you started to get suburbs um, building up along those, uh, along those railways where people could locate out in the village or in a, in a, in a, a country location and still have access downtown. Uh, that trend uh, magnified with, with, electri with electrified transit, the, the, the street railways, and, and, sub, and then subways uh, in the late 19th century, dramatically allowing the city to expand uh, in reach um, and, and people to spread out. And, and so, sorry, I keep banging this thing. Um, and, and we tend to think about transit as, as promoting density and promoting concentration, but any time you have a new technology that allows you to travel far, further, farther, faster, that allows people to actually spread out. And so, and so the coming of, of public transit actually led to, uh, to the first de-densification of cities as people moved out. Now they still, by today's standards, 
generated high densities around the transit lines and the transit stations, but they were, they were less dense, less dense than the, than the pre-industrial city. And again, New York provides a good example of this. Uh, arguably, it's been argued that lower, uh, you know, lower, the Lower East Side in Manhattan um, before the subways was arguably the most dense place on earth. Incredible, incredible density because people uh, live there, cheap housing, access to, to jobs in the textile industry and other industries, and people basically had to live there because they were poor uh, and they, they had to walk to work. The subway allowed them uh, to, to move out of that but still have cheap uh, convenient access to the jobs that were still, still in lower Manhattan. And so you saw the Bronx and Brooklyn uh, really started to develop with the subway. The subway created the potential for the Bronx to develop and for development to go on around, around the subway stations. The, the Industrial Revolution, however, not just, did not just change the transportation capabilities, but they created a, a, a demand for larger cities because in, industries, factories need labor, need, need workers. The only place you could find a sufficient labor pool to support the big industries that were emerging were, were in the city. And of course, it's a chicken and egg. The existence of factories uh, and job opportunities attracted people into the cities. And so you have a, a, a process that feeds on itself in, in which the more people are in the city, the bigger the labor force, uh, the, the, the bigger the opportunity to create more industry, uh, the bigger the market to sell, sell to those people, the need for more transportation to move those people around. And, and, so, and, and so, so the Industrial Revolution was not just a revolution in manufacturing capabilities um, and, and our ability to you know, make machines and, and, and textiles and various things, but it really did revolutionize uh, the nature and role of cities and, and provide the economic dynamic for cities to, to grow large. And, and then the mechanized transportation made it feasible to move all the, these much larger um, numbers of people around in, in a convenient way. And so what we had is the 19th century, uh, the, the post-industrial revolution city was, was the industrial city, if you will, uh, was also an industrial, also had an industrial, if you will, transportation system in that it was vehicle-based as opposed to, to biologically based and also is, is largely one of public transport, taxis and buses and streetcars and, and, and so forth. Um, and so be before, basically, people had, were by, by and large, self-supplying their transportation. Now, we were, the cities were able to build these very large, um, again, subways, streetcar companies, and so on. Now, when I say public, most of these were actually private operations, uh, and people could make money uh, at five cents a pop, uh, a ride, um, on these systems. But it was providing this, this mass transit to, to the population. And so, as I've already described, a chicken and egg situation exists in the city, and the reason cities grow uh, from sort of a mechanistic or economic point of view is this notion that, uh, again, there may be an initial location advantage. This is why something locates in a certain place. Um, so an activity is attracted to that place. The existence of that activity, if it's successful, attracts more of that, that activity, typically, but it also attracts supporting and other types of activities that so can take advantage of the critical mass that's building up. And, and, that, uh, and, and, so, and so that feeds on itself. We, 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 we grow the economy and activities and the population that way. And this growth in population and in economic activity gives rise for the need for more inf transportation infrastructure. And if we supply that, that, that increased uh, transportation infrastructure and the accessibility it provides creates greater locational advantage for this location and will typically attract even more activity. And so this is what in systems theory we would call positive feedback. You know, if something increases, that, inc that leads to a further increase. And, and the system ratchets itself up. And this is characteristic of human activities as opposed to most natural activities. In, in, in a natural uh, ecological habitat, there's typically negative feedback, uh, feedbacks. There's a balancing to try to maintain some sort of equi equilibrium in the swamp or whatever or the forest. But the, the characteristic of, of, of human um, systems is, is that we, we're capable of creating these positive feedbacks. Now that's how we grow cities. It's also how cities can decline because just as you can have a positive virtuous cycle feeding on itself, you can also create negative feedbacks uh, or uh, 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 vicious cycles in which a decline leads to further decline and so on. Currently, the poster child for that is Detroit, where you know the city has gone into decline, and the more it declines, the more it declines. Um, 
The other concern about positive feedback loops is they do tend to accelerate, and, and one of the reasons we have so much, so many issues with respect to climate, uh, greenhouse gases, and sustainability, and consumption of land, and all the sustainability issues we're faced with, is we tend to consume more and more and more to, to, to feed that machine. And so one of the challenges, I think, in building sustainable cities is how do we maintain you know, the economic well-being, the social well-being, uh, perhaps maintain some element of positive feedback without it running away and losing control. Um, the second revolution in transportation, obviously, was the automobile, which, uh, you know, the first autos came into existence uh, late 19th century, but it wasn't until the early 20th century that, um, that uh, you know, it, it really started to have an impact. It was really Ford's Model T that changed everything. Before the Model T, uh, the car was a rich man's toy. It wasn't a common thing for people to use, but the, the, you know, the you know, true revolution of Henry Ford creating an affordable car, a car for the common man that people could, ordinary people could aspire to, changed everything. And, uh, and we could start to see the impact of the car on cities even in the 1920s. Uh, you started to see congestion and, and started to see a decline in transit usage because pe so many people were starting to use cars. That process of, of, of motorization, however, was interrupted for two decades by, first of all, the Great Depression when nobody had any money even to buy cars, even the Model Ts, and then World War II in which everything was diverted into building tanks instead of cars. Uh, and there was no gasoline to run your cars with. Uh, so so uh, uh, everything was sort of put on hold until, uh, un until after World War II, but then uh, starting in the late 40s, early 50s, continuing on really to today, the motorization of our cities uh, took force in full vengeance, and, and suburbs, which had started with, uh, with the streetcar railways, uh, you know, exploded under the car, because the, car now, the cars and the highways we built to to facilitate the, the movement of cars permitted a massive ex uh, expansion of the cities and a massive decentral, uh, uh, not just decentralization, but de-densification, deconcentration of our cities out into, into the, the sprawling suburban type of landscape that uh, we're, we're very familiar with in, in, in every North American city. Um, but it is also an interesting side point to note that, as I've already said a couple of times, suburbanization started with the street railways. Los Angeles, which is a city we, we, we always think of as one of the poster childs for both highways and sprawl, the basic pattern of, 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 of the suburban style of, of Los Angeles started with the streetcar railways. The Pacific Gas and Electric Company wanted to create a market for their electricity. They bought up orange groves, developed, subdivided the land into, into suburban, suburban residential areas, built the streetcar line out to, that connected that suburb into the downtown where the jobs still were. And, and so they made money three or four times. They made money on developing the land and selling the houses. They made money on the, on the streetcar company, which again, in those days, you couldn't make money on. And they made money selling electricity, both the houses and, and, and the streetcars. Um, so uh, so we've, we've seen these shifts in technology. And of, and, and, and of course, with each shift in technology, the old technologies don't go away. I mean, we still walk, we still bike, uh, at least some of us, some of the time, when, when it's a, a possibility to do so. We still use transit. Not, and transit's not nearly the dominant mode it once was, but again, in the right place at the right time, people use, use transit, particularly to go into downtown cores. Uh, but it's, it's obviously, it's very clear that, the automo that we live in automobile-dominated cities. They, these uh, flow chart, these, these charts uh, are not terribly important, but you, you know this is this is showing modal shares in, in typical modal shares in the Toronto region. About 64 percent of the people drive; another 16 percent are passengers in cars. So 80 percent of all trips, uh, based on the year this data was collected, and this is very typical, occur in a car, um, and and transit only uh, accounts for about 10, 10 11 percent. And, and, and this is, and Toronto is a relatively transit-oriented city by, by, by much of North American standards. Canadian cities, certainly compared to American cities, are transit-oriented compared to, to most, most US cities, certainly once you get outside of New York and, and Chicago. So we live in an auto-based world. And the question is, what's wrong with that? I mean, people, people buy cars, they use them. Uh, what's the problem? Well, the problem 
is that the car doesn't scale well as cities grow. Um, that that a car, the capacity, the carrying capacity of cars to carry people, which ultimately is what we need to be doing. We're not looking to move cars around, we're looking to move people. Um, you can only move so many people uh, by cars. And, and when cities reach a certain scale, the car becomes dysfunctional. And, and, and we get the congestion and the traffic jams that we're all too familiar with in Vancouver and Toronto and everywhere else. Um, we just can't build enough roads to, uh, to carry all the people that would like to travel by car as cities grow. In rural areas, small towns, even small, medium-sized cities, car, setting the environmental issues of you know, carbon and that sort of thing aside, the cars can, can function reasonably well. But, but as I say, when cities reach a certain size, they simply, the car simply is not the solution anymore. It becomes the problem instead of the solution. And so clearly, I mean, the, the cities are going to continue to grow. Uh, again, this urbanization trend is, is, uh, is a universal fact. Canadian cities are going to grow because Canada is such an attractive place to people from around the world. And we more or less welcome people from around the world. And so our, our, our cities are growing largely through immigration. Uh, so, so our Canadian cities are going to continue to grow. So the question is, how do we handle that? How do we design a city that can grow, that can be, can be large and, and eventually larger uh, in a way that, that isn't, isn't dysfunctional, that isn't at some point become pathological. And the only answer to that, I mean, it's, there's, you know, there's only so many degrees of freedom here, is that the system has to be much more multimodal. That yes, we need roads to move cars and particularly trucks, um, but we need transit, we need a lot more transit, and we need to be building cities that encourage people to walk and bike as well, so that, so the, you know, not, not every trip has to be a motorized trip. So, so you know, right now we have, we have cars and we have everything else. We need, we need to rebalance this, because that's the only way we can provide the capacity and, and reasonable levels of service at reasonable cost to people that, that make living in cities worthwhile. Um, and, 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 and so the challenge is how to go about doing that. And it, it, it's, it's not that anyone is anti-car per se, but the, car, the point is the car provides you with all sorts of benefits. The reason the car is so successful is it, it, it provides huge accessibility services, so it allows us to participate in all the activities we want to participate in. The problem with the car is that you know, it has a lot of what economists would call externalities, unintended consequences. Uh, greenhouse gas, pollution, sp sprawl, congestion, accidents, lack of exercise, uh, you know, health. so there's significant health impacts, significant uh, urban form impacts, there's, uh, significant impacts on productivity because when we reach a certain level of congestion, we, uh, we, we, we lose productivity. And so the question is, again, is to rebalance that equation so the benefits of, of using the car outweigh the negatives, and, 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 and what that really means is creating situations in which there's alternatives to people so that the only people, so the people use the car when they need to, but for most, for most trips, or at least uh, a lot of trips, they have options and people, people can choose to do something else. The problem with the city we've built is that most people are captive to the car. Even if they want to take transit, transit may not exist for the to serve the trip they want to make, or it's so inconvenient and, and so unreliable, et cetera, et cetera, that, that no one would use it unless they literally have no other choice. Um, and, uh, and, and to illustrate this, uh, this notion of the inefficiency of, of the car, uh, I, I like to use this graph. I'm an engineer, so I get a little, little nerdy once in a while, and I've got to show, show a, a, a graph or two. Uh, but this one's, this one's pretty simple. This, this is a very simple model of the travel time on a link in the transportation network. I mean, we, the sort of models that we build that Jinwa was talking about, um, you know, we have a computerized representation of the road network and the transit network in the computer. So one link, you know, one, one street from intersection to intersection, uh, you know, we model, the, mm -hmm. we, we end up predicting the, the number of trips using on that link, and then the travel time on that link is a function of the congestion. So what this is saying, here's, Here's the travel time on the link, and here's the number of cars per hour trying to use it. And, and uh, this is a fairly crude model, but it's the sort of thing we use all the time because qualitatively, uh, it, it, it describes what's going on. You know, if there's very very little flow on the road, um, you know, there's basically you have a free flow travel time, which is a function of the speed. You know. Um, 
the, uh, the speed limit and so forth. That's, that's as fast as you can ever go. And, and, and for a while, as, as cars are added in, it doesn't really have much impact. But at some point, uh, congestion starts to happen. The interaction between cars starts to lead to delay on the system. Everything starts to slow down. And once we, particularly once we get past capacity, uh, we, get, we get queuing going on and huge delays going on. And so, and so the more people using it, the increasing congestion leads to increasing delay. We all know it. We experience it every day. Uh, so this is for a single link in, in, in the system. But this qualitatively holds for the entire system. There's only so much capacity in the system. And as we load it, at some point, you know, it gets, it gets uh, if I'll use the term pathological, it, it, you know, it starts to become, if not pathological, at least very dysfunctional. Uh, the system stops working the way we want it to work. Um, and so as cities grow, they simply cannot build enough roadways to carry the traffic. The road system simply isn't, isn't going to um, you know, cut it. Um, and I, I just was Googling around and grabbed this, uh, somewhat at random, this, this article out of the, uh, uh, I guess it was on CBC. Uh, I had to chuckle because uh, just switch Metro Vancouver to Metro Toronto, and this would be the same headline that we see in Toronto all the time. I think we have to have a, you know, a, 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 a um, rest, arm wrestling match or something to, to see who has the worst congestion in Canada because it, it's almost a matter of pride these days who has, you know, who has the worst congestion because um, uh, that makes you a big city or something. But, the, but certainly both Vancouver, Toronto and just about everywhere else, uh, the ranking doesn't matter too much and I think there's a lot of measurement error in, in most of these things uh, that lead to these, these, these rankings. But the point is that in all our cities as we've grown, we've reached some sort of a tipping point where, where you know, it's starting to hurt. I mean, people talk about gridlock a, lot, uh, gridlock a lot, certainly in Toronto. We don't have gridlock in Toronto. I don't think you have gridlock here. But you have congestion that's exceeded some threshold that is starting to become painful. And people, people are, are, you know, have problems with that. So again, what do we do about that? Well, again, for short trips, walking and biking, the more we can build an urban form, a neighborhood form that, that uh, has mixed usage, has uh, you know, at, least, at least moderate densities, that has decent sidewalks, that is walkable and is attractive for, for walking or biking, and, and is safe to walk and bike in, the better. Uh, because that is still the, the very best, from an environmental point of view, <laughs> that's by far the best thing you can do. From a health point of view, it's the best, uh, best thing you can do. From, an econ you know, from a financial point of view, building sidewalks is pretty cheap. Uh, so providing the infrastructure is simple. So, so the more we can, we can build our neighborhoods and design our neighborhoods so people can walk and bike for shorter trips and, and, and they can be making shorter trips because there's stores and opportunities, uh, there's, there's uh, trip attractors that uh, are nearby that you can walk to instead of having to get your car to you know, drive a couple of, couple of kilometers to, to the closest milk store, um, the better off we are. Um, and, and, uh, and, and of course in our current, in much of our urban design, well our suburban design, it's really not, they're really not walkable at, at this point in time. There's no place to walk to. Uh, there's very, sometimes there's not even sidewalks. Um, just the, even the street design, classic curved linear streets and so on are very discouraging to, to people walking. People like to walk in straight lines. Um, so our urban form in much of our cities um, outside of downtowns is not, are not very walkable or bikeable. But also, not all trips are short trips. Uh, and again, particularly as cities get large, there are going to be longer trips. Not everybody can live and work close by. You may live in one neighborhood. The job you get may be on the other side of town. And there's really not much you can do about that. And given housing prices and kids in school and all sorts of things, you're not just going to move across town because you got a new job there. So, so not all trips can possibly be short. Uh, and, and so for longer trips, we are back to mechanized transportation. And so, and, and so that's either the car or it's public transit. And public transit can the right circumstances be much, much more efficient in carrying large volumes of people. Uh, and, and this is, there's, there's been a number of these sorts of pictures over time, but you know, the, the point is, you know, look at all that congestion, look at all those cars. Well, every person in that picture inside those cars fits in that bus. And so, and, and so if we could just induce people to use the bus rather than drive their single occupants vehicle cars, we would have lots of lots of capacity on the roadway to move people and different transit. There's different transit technologies, of course, and so we can 
in principle, match, match technology to markets, to corridors, to try to provide, to provide the capacity needed uh, if we can attract people into it. And, and just as, a, as an example, uh, the Young Street subway in Toronto can carry up to 35,000 people an hour per direction. That's 14 lanes of highway. Uh, so can you imagine what Toronto would be like if we didn't have the Young Street subway or the Bloor Danforth subway? Um, can you imagine, uh, you know, here with your sky trains? I mean, uh, I mean, the, the capacity of, of the sky train isn't that high. It's, it's more, it's more down around here, I think. But, but still, it's moving a tremendous number of people, much, much more than you could move uh, in, in multiple lanes of highway to try to replace them. So, you know, transit can be. A, a way out in terms of being able to carry much larger numbers of people in an efficient sort of way. And certainly, if we see the successful world cities, the cities that both Vancouver and Toronto, and, et cetera, would, would like to emulate or consider themselves to be more or less in the same class as, in, in some sense, um, you know, the, the New Yorks, the Londons, et cetera, every one of these cities has, has, has an excellent transit system. Um, because, and and it, this is not a frill. This is essential. New York, London, Paris, Tokyo could not exist. They could not function if they didn't have a massive transit system. There's just simply no way you could move all the people in and out of lower Manhattan each day without, without, without the transit system that they have. There's no way you could move all that by cars. And so the very existence of these cities depends on an appropriate transit system. So it's not, as I said, not a frill. It's an absolutely necessary condition uh, for, for cities beyond a certain size if they're going to be productive. And coming back to the car, my little, my little volume delay curve here, another point to note is we're not talking about getting everybody out of their cars. But again, the, the nature of, of the system is you know, a relatively small change in volume can make a relatively large change in, 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 in the delay people experience. Every time one more car gets on the street or the highway, not only does that car experience delay, it introduces extra delay for every single other car out there. So if we can get even a few cars off the road using transit, everybody else is better off. So transit's a win-win situation. The best friend a car driver has is a good transit system. Because if, let's say, you really are captive of the car, you need the car legitimately, if, but other people have more flexibility, if you can get those people off the road, then you, you're, you're better off even if you're not using transit. I was once on a CBC radio show uh, talking about congestion and, and the other guy, the other guest, was a truck driver who had just gotten off a 12-hour shift. He drives up and down the 401 every day uh, supplying uh, you know, one of the General Motors plants. And he was the biggest transit act advocate you could find because he recognized this, that, that the best way to get rid of all those cars that was stopping him from making his delivery would be to provide people with other options uh, so they didn't all have have to be out there. Uh, and this is my second graph. Um, and what this is showing is, again, this is, a very, this is an actual sort of model that we use um, uh, to predict who uses transit and who uses cars. Uh, and so the vertical axis in this case is the probability of somebody taking transit uh, to work. And the horizontal axis, here's the zero point here, this is negative positive is the difference between what we call the transit utility and the auto utility. Uh, what we mean by utility is, is sort of the, the weighted sum of people's perception of how good the mode is. It's a, it's a combination of in-vehicle travel time, wait time, walk time, reliability, uh, all the factors that, you, you know, if you think about why do I take transit or why don't I take transit, well, it's too slow, I have to walk too far. It's the frequ service frequency is, is, is Way, way too low. Uh, it's very unreliable. Well, we can take all those things, we can measure that, and we can combine it into sort of one combined index or measure that we call utility. Same for, same for auto. And so then, you know, quite reasonably, the, the, the bigger auto is, or in this case all modes, relative to transit. And so if, if transit is worse than this, it's, it, it, that, that term is negative. If transit's better than the other modes, it's positive. And so not surprisingly, the probability you know, intuitively, it makes sense. The probability of using transit goes up as the transit system improves. Um, and, and so, you know, being very simple-minded about what we're trying to accomplish is that we would like transit, the transit services we're providing to be, you know, well, maybe ideally over here, but this, this is very difficult. It, it's, 
there's not many places where, where transit is so dominant that virtually everybody uses transit, although there are some small corridors in Toronto where maybe 80% of the people going to work into the downtown Toronto actually do use transit, so they're up there. But idea, at least we'd like to have transit in this range in here where transit's kind of competi competitive, plus or minus, and also the, sort of the rate of change of probability uh, with respect to improving transit is very steep. So you know, a small change, small improvement in the transit system can lead to quite a large increase in people using transit. And so from a policy point of view, we'd like to get our city so that as much of the city uh, is in, in this range here uh, as possible. Our problem is we've built cities where for an awful lot of the trips going on, they, they lie out here. Transit's a very inferior good. Uh, and so very few people take transit. And from a policy point of view, it's also a challenge because to improve the transit system to a point where it's starting to be competitive, we might have to spend a lot of money to, to improve the system before we see much, much bang for the buck. And that, that is kind of discouraging. Now, what does this have to do with land use in urban form? Well, the, what did I just say? I mean, much of, many, many trips are over here those are trips are su suburb to suburb type trips. So it is the where you fall in this curve has an awful lot to do with the land use, the urban form, where that trip is coming from and going to. If you're if you're in in a, in a relatively high density corridor that has good transit service and you're working downtown, um, you you have. Um, uh, uh, that, that's a situation in which there is a demand that, ca that can be created for transit. It's an area where there's potentially enough demand that it's cost effective to provide good transit service. So again, there's a supply to reaction. There's enough people who could potentially use it to make worthwhile building transit. If you build the transit, people will use it. Uh, and, and so it's the urban form, ultimately, that determines the potential for transit. Uh, and, and these days we talk a lot about transit, uh, and we, and we, and, you know, people may recognize that we can't build the roads to carry everybody. So they say we have to build transit, and yes, that's true. But the next step, the next logical step, they don't often take. If transit is going to be successful, building the transit is not enough. We have to evolve and change our urban form into an urban form, a density, a mixture of use, a concentration along nodes and corridors that is conducive to the use of transit. And, and, uh, and because if not, if we just build very expensive transit lines through single use, low density areas, it's a waste of money because certainly in the short run, nobody's going to use it and people will only use it if, if the land use actually somehow evolves over time to make use of it. And just to try to illustrate this connection between uh, urban form and, and transportation, I always like to show this. This, uh, this is Toronto. This is downtown, this is showing the jobs, the distribution of jobs in the greater Toronto area. This is downtown Toronto, which is the largest employment place not only in the greater Toronto area, but, but Canada. And here's the second biggest employment zone in the Toronto area, which is out by Pearson Airport. There's a, a huge industrial and office complex out by the airport. So a huge number of jobs out there. And then we also see jobs uh, you know, uh, in various places in other parts, uh, other parts of the region. So that's jobs. If we actually turn those jobs into density, the density of jobs per unit area, we get this map here and we actually see a very different picture. Here's downtown Toronto, huge density in downtown Toronto, and then really a very uniform smearing of jobs on a density point of view over much of the rest of, much of, the, rest of the region. And, and why that's important is it ties directly into how much transit we can provide, because what sort of a market is there, and how many people will use it. This is showing the travel pattern, the trip origins over a 24-hour period to downtown Toronto, which is right down there someplace. And what we see is a huge concentration of trips, a huge range over which people are willing to travel, because downtown Toronto, of course, is a, is a major center. Uh, but we see concentrations, both locally uh, within the old city of Toronto, but also along corridors, up the Young Street corridor, along the Lake Shore, and so on. And so, and so there's a pattern, there's a concentration and a pattern of trips to downtown Toronto that is servable by transit. And, and, and if we then, um, this is Mississauga Square One, which is a regional suburban center. 
has a somewhat similar pattern, uh, but, but, but smaller. But the airport, this is the, the interesting one here. Here's the distribution of trips going to that airport area. And there's no concentration. I mean, the range is almost as big because, because it's, a, it's a major center as well in some sense. So it attracts trips from everywhere, just like more or less Toronto downtown. But there is no concentration. There is no corridors. There's, no, there's nothing you can hang your hat on in terms of building transit that would serve that travel pattern. And that, we can see that directly in terms of the, the modal shares. Uh, whether we're looking all day or AM peak, uh, PD1 is, is, is a planning district one, the downtown of Toronto, huge transit mode shares in the morning peak period, over 50% of the trips, regardless of where you come from. The colors here are different, different locations. Doesn't matter where you're traveling from, if you're going to downtown Toronto in the morning peak period, if, over 50% of those trips are by transit. Why? Because again, we have that pattern of, of travel behavior of demand that's generated by the urban for, the Toronto urban form uh, and the downtown, the concentration of attractions in the downtown that allows us to build commuter rail lines and subways and so on into it so we can provide the demand is there to, that makes it possible to provide the supply that's attractive uh, to people use. And by the time we get out to Pearson Airport, there's almost nobody using transit to get to and from the airport area. And we can look at all sorts of statistics. It doesn't matter what you look at. Uh, the relationship to urban form is strong. So if we're looking at number of vehicles per household, for example, versus residential density, the denser the area, the fewer vehicles there are in households because people have more and more options. They can walk and bike more often. Transit's better. They, they don't need as many cars. Trip lengths, people, again, because people have more denser areas, there's more opportunities to shop or go to a restaurant or whatever close by, maybe even have a job nearby. Uh, so again, as density goes up, the trip lengths that people are making, even if they're by car, go down um, uh, with, with density. Uh, environmental impact, uh, this is showing the, the shading, the darker the shading, the more CO2 per day being generated by households on average in the greater Toronto area uh, through transportation. So, so again, as we move out from, from downtown Toronto, people become more auto-oriented. Um, they have fewer transit options. They're traveling longer distances. Uh, and, so, and so their CO2 production goes up. And the cost, the, of, uh, the amount of how much it costs to travel over the year. This, this is, ooh, that's, that's supposed to be red. <laughs> anyway, um, again, uh, the darker, the big important thing is darker. The further you live away from the downtown, the more you spend per year on transportation to travel around. And it's, an ins it's a very significant cost. Housing is the thing most of us spend uh, the biggest chunk of our money on. Transportation is, is next. In Toronto, at least when we did this study, which was a while ago, was about, on average about 18% of our, our income went to housing. 15% went to transportation. So this is, this is non-trivial. Um, I, I'm, I'm going, uh, well, what I want to say. Um, so let me get to the third revolution because I'm uh, re reaching near the end of the hour and I want, to, I want to try to wrap things up. So what's the third revolution? The third revolution basically is doing what I've been talking about, rebalancing um, between the car and other usages um, of the other modes of transportation so that, so that we can have a more sustainable city. Uh, revolution in some ways may be a, may not be, uh, maybe a little overly dramatic because it, it, one could argue maybe it's just a radical evolution. I'm not sure where the boundary line is. And in particular, if we look at places like Europe, uh, it, it, there's no revolution at all because cities are already typically built more or less that way. But we can imagine, again, these are scenes from different areas in the, in the Toronto area, of what we might be able to do with some of our, our existing town centers and some of our existing suburban areas uh, to change them into mixed use, higher density, more transit, and walk and bike friendly areas. Um, and, uh, and in this, this re so-called revolution, cars will still be a major mode of transport, but we just want, we want to get it down from that 80% to something, and I don't know what that percentage is, where we are able to maintain the system and provide mobility and accessibility to all uh, in, in, a proper, in a suitable sort of way. Um, the big change and the big challenge, and why I, why I do think this is revolutionary, is this time around, it's not about technology per se. The first two revolutions were all about technology. Somebody invented a better mousetrap, and we all ran out and bought it. Um, 
we're not really inventing new mousetraps here. The technology we have uh, is more or less what we're going to, we're to be stuck with. What we're talking about is cultural and political shifts, our attitudes towards the city, our attitudes and our approaches to city building and what sort of city we want to live in and hence what sort of transportation system we want to have to both facilitate and, and, and serve that city. Uh, and I think this is in many respects the most challenging of all because there was a certain technological determinism to the car. I mean, you know, people invented the cars and as soon as they could afford it, people said, yeah, wow, that's great, let's do it. Here, we're, we're, we're having to change the way we think, the way we, we um, our assumptions about, about how to build cities. And I think that's actually a tougher job than just simply adopting the, the, the next better mousetrap that, that's, that's coming down the line. Um, and in particular, to a certain extent, as has already been indicated, it returns to some time, in many respects to, to older ways of thinking, certainly in terms of transit, uh, you know, returning to transit as a major mode of transportation, but also in terms of our street designs and our neighborhood designs and our overall city designs, uh, getting back to more traditional na neighborhood designs that, that are more walkable, uh, that do generate uh, better densities, that, uh, that promote the use of transit, make transit feasible. Uh, so, so again, it's not as if we don't have the tools, it's not as if we don't have the knowledge, what we need is the will and, 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 and the desire to build cities in, in, in a new old way in, in many respects that, um, that, that will uh, accomplish the things we want to accomplish. Uh, and to do that, I mean, the sorts of action items, uh, still very broad, we do have to aggress, uh, invest aggressively and innovate and wisely in major upgrades to our public transit systems. We, we, we desperately, uh, certainly in the Toronto region, but e even here in Vancouver, I think you've been doing a better job, but we need more transit. But we have to put it in the right places and we have to use the right technologies. We have to rethink the street consistently uh, so that it's, uh, it's, it's more attractive and a safer place to walk and bike and, and promotes that. And, and again, we have to start reconfiguring where we can and as we can uh, urban form. Uh, that has both to do with redeveloping and infill existing areas. There's still greenfield development going on all the time at the urban fringe. I don't know how it is here. Certainly in Toronto, it's the same old, same old in terms of what's happening on the suburban fringe. It's the same auto-oriented, uh, low-density, single-use kind of landform, despite all the planning, good words and plan in, in municipal plans and all the talk about you know more sustainable development. What's going, the shovels in the ground happening right now tend to be the same old, same old. So we've got to change that, uh, you know, so that uh, you know we're building for the long run, but we make decisions today. So as the shovel's going to ground today, they're going to influence what the city looks like 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now. And the only way we get to the long run is starting today making better decisions in, in each and everything we do. Uh, there's lots of ways we can improve, improve transit service. Um, I don't think I'll spend much time talking about this, but, uh, but uh, one, I guess one of the points is walk and wait time and reliability are probably more important than speed. Uh, and obviously speed in the vehicle is useful, but what really affects your door-to-door -door time, which is important more often than not, unless it's a very long distance trip, is how long does it take you to walk to the transit and, and then from the transit to the other end, how, how long do you have to wait for the transit, and how reliable it is. Are you standing in the, in the rain, uh, waiting, hoping that maybe a bus is going to show up, or is there always a bus in sight? Uh, and so in thinking about our systems, these are the sorts of things we should be thinking about. Um, and so, so if we're going to get better transit, it's not just the billion dollar subways or, or, or big lines, it's doing everything right, uh, running coordinated bus systems and so, and, and so forth. So what we need is a coordinated systematic plan for both the short and long run. There's always things we can be doing in the short run that will make things better more or less today while we're building some of our longer run things. We have to think in network levels, not just individual projects. How does this project, how does this line fit into the network we're trying to build? We always have to be thinking about increasing frequency. We always have to be thinking about improving reliability. Um, and we have to be taking the right technology and using the right technology in the right places. And we have to put all this together. Again, there's many, many things we can be doing in the short and long run. Uh, and and, and the, the challenge is to build that, that comprehensive plan, that thoughtful plan that, that's taking the various building blocks, the various pieces, and using them appropriately. 
Transit networks also have to be hierarchical. Uh, the only way you can compete with the car, which provides door-to-door -door service, is to try to provide transit that gets as close to that. While we can't have a bus at, at, every, at every door, so but what we need is, is a local bus that's within reasonable walking distance of most people, and that bus then takes you to a higher order, faster, uh, higher capacity system that maybe takes you to even a higher one, depending on how far you're traveling. And then at the other end, we have to have the same, same sort of hierarchy. And if you look at the, the European systems, what characterizes them, and distinguishes them relative to most North American systems is the wonderful hierarchy they have from the bus to the tram to the, to the, to the subway to the commuter rail, all integrated in, in, in a very comprehensive way. And so uh, I, you know, what I've been trying to paint a picture here of is if we do want a sustainable future and a sustainable urban transportation system, there, we would argue that there's actually four pillars that, that we have to build upon to accomplish that. Uh, I've been talking in this, in this talk, I've talked a little bit about neighborhoods, I've talked mainly about infrastructure. Financing, as, as you well know here, um, is very important in terms of we may have good ideas, but can we, can we afford to build it? We have to find the money for it, and we have to have good governance that leads to good decision making. We could spend the next several hours talking about those things. I won't talk about them, but, but they are obviously important as well. Um, and so we bring all this together, and um, this is the cover of, of your long-range transportation plan, Transport to 2040, uh, from TransLink. And I, I just think this, is, this sums up everything. What is it we're trying to accomplish? We're trying to build the city that she's going to live in. And in and, 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 and debating financing and debating all these things, we shouldn't be thinking about today, because no matter what we do, tomorrow the congestion is going to be the same. What we have to, you know, we're not going to solve our transportation problems today or tomorrow or even next year. We want to be building a transportation system and a city that she can live in and that we, that, that, and that we want for her. Uh, and as I like to say, fail, failure to do so is not an option. This is something we, we, we must do. We need to get on with it. So thank you for your attention, and um, uh, I mean, I, I've run past, just past the 7.30, so I don't know whether we can take questions or, or we, hmm? Yeah, yeah, there's, so there's a reception uh, immediately out there, so I'd be happy to, you know, sort of one-on-one -on -one take any questions during the reception.